Hello and welcome to the Unpruned Interview. My name is Sarah Brown and this is a series of garden organic interviews where we let our guests chat at length on subjects which are close to their hearts. Often the topic is too important or too riveting for us to press the edit button. In gardening terms you could say we're happy to leave their words unpruned. You may have heard our guest Stephanie Hafferty in last month's podcast when she joined Charles Dowding to talk about their book, The No Dig Organic Home and Garden. Now we hear Steph on her own. It was a dark and very windy night back in February when I met her. But before we start, a quick word from our lovely sponsors, Viridian Nutrition. Viridian are the leading brand of ethical vitamins. They're passionate about sustainably sourced ingredients and have one of the largest ranges of organic vitamins and supplements. For them, it's all about purity, potency and provenance, with every product containing only 100% active ingredients. Find out more at viridiannutrition.com. That's viridian with a V hyphen nutrition.com. Steph, it's such a delight to meet you. When did you start growing, Steph? When did gardening come into your life? Um, Actually, I was always interested in being in the garden. And my granddad had grew some things and my great granddad had an allotment. So it was always in my mind that you could do it, but nobody at home did. And then I got a, found a book when I was about 17 in a charity shop, which I've still got. And it's the Farmer's Weekly Wives Book of Alcohol Recipes. Oh, lovely. 17, that's bingo. I know, that's what I thought. And so I was looking through it and I discovered you can make wine out of various things and they you can make them out of marrows. So I grew some courgette plant marrows in my parents' very nice back <laughs> garden in the corner. For making alcohol, I got really into making <laughs> wine, which makes you very popular when you're young. And I'd go on all these walks to get elderberries because you could make wine out of it. <laughs> when I went to university, I went with two demijohns of elderflower, elderberry wine. <laughs> this is the most remarkable introduction to organic growing I've heard. <laughs> it was basically getting drunk with your friends. <laughs> That's what it was, cheaply. And now it's more about food than alcohol, though ah, I do okay. still. That's why there's a bottle of rum on the mantelpiece. It's really I hadn't noticed it. Infusing. <laughs> <laughs> and you and Charles both um, are strong advocates of the no dig technique. Absolutely, Which, yeah. of course, is actually quite old and, and mm. has been come down through the ages. But totally. you both are very strong spokesmen for it. How, how did you get into no dig? Um... I kind of heard about it. I had my allotment, I've had, which is just up the road, and I had that, I think it's about 15 years now. And, of course, I dug it, because that's what you did, and that's mm-hmm. what the Jeff Hamilton book I had did. That was um, his organic book. That was my gardening book that my mum had bought me once for Christmas. Then I would hear about this bloke called Charles who lived in the area and did this no-dig thing, and living quite near Glastonbury... I thought, oh, well, he's one of, he's probably just one of those guys that sits there and thinks of other things while smoking interesting substances and just lets things grow. It just sounded really weird. But I was in the local library and I saw the book and I thought, oh, well, I'll have a look. And I, I looked through it. And it was spookily at the same time, I was looking for some work and a friend of mine mentioned that this guy locally was needing someone to help in the garden. And I applied and I got the job working with Charles. So ah. I was, yeah, so that's how I got properly. It was like an immersion in it. So I worked yes. there for two and a half years. Yes. And then I left there to work elsewhere. I then started to do my own thing for other clients. Mm. So it was almost like a kind of no-dig university because it was quite a long time. It was a deep immersion yeah. into it straight away. Yeah, so and doing that thing of growing over two years, of it really helps because you start to learn and this is what's next and this is what's next and what you do with different weather. and Yes. Yeah, yeah. so that's... Because there's really no... I think this we're seduced into thinking gardening is a quick fix and, no. and it it's not it's it's you have to take time you have to learn from mistakes you have to be observe and particularly with organic gardening you're so observant mm. about what works and what doesn't exactly so and and never, you never know what the weather's going to do oh no that's so, very true know. 
I have to say, um, dear listener, when I arrived at Steph's house, I immediately knew it was her house because other the other houses in the row had the inevitable one or two rose bushes and a bit of tired lawn. Steph's has raised beds with vegetables and netting and a little fruit tree. It mm. was I get the impression every inch of your house and your garden is used to grow and cook and to make the most of plants, is that right? Yes, as much as possible. I've even got potatoes chitting on the bedroom floor of my son who's at university. (laughs) And there's mushroom boxes in there all doing their thing. Um, Yeah, as much as I possibly can. In the back garden, uh, there's an area of concrete here. Back in the day, many years ago, a builder lived here. He seemed to have a great enthusiasm for concrete. So when my children were little, they played on it. That was great. But as they grew up, I've tried to turn that into a productive area. So I have a potted forest garden there. I grow lots of different kinds of things. I now have a veggie pod that I'm trialling out for making... Sorry, say that again. It's a thing called a veggie pod. Describe it to me. It is a planter. It's, gosh, two metres long. Mm -hmm. It's waist height, so it's on legs, quite deep. And it has a fitted hood, like a cloche. I'm trying that out to see about growing on a hard pl- standing, making that productive. Also waist height growing. Yes. That interests me because I've got osteoarthritis. So although I'm fine, I have my creaky moments. So actually having things where I don't have to go too low down is a pleasure. I've only had it a few weeks, but it's growing salad and things like that at the moment. Um, so your growing area isn't very big behind the house. Though. It's... About 30 by 100 feet, which is... The average size of a small back garden. Yeah, this is um, an ex-council house. It was built in the 1930s, and it's in a fairly rural... It's in a market town, but it's a country market town. And back in those days, when they made council houses, they made sure the gardens were big enough so that people could grow food for their families. And in theory, the garden was big enough to grow food have fruit trees, keep chickens and a pig. And because of the concrete area, I'm making that as productive as possible with all these pots. I've got various fruit trees in pots, medlars and apples and pears and cherries and nectarines, all kinds of things. But your theme is very much to keep yourself in plant food throughout the year, isn't that right? Pretty much entirely as much as I possibly can. Uh, Within reason, obviously. Um, I have lemon trees in my kitchen. They're overwintering there, so I try citrus as well. But yes, absolutely. So the polytunnel is full of vegetables. I have salad in there, um, leaves that I can cook with, so they can either be raw or used in stir fries or in soups or stews. I have brassicas that will produce earlier than the brassicas at the allotment. Um, So that produces food really right up to the hungry gap when I've got things in outside that are producing. Now, the hungry gap, just to listeners, is not when the sun comes home from university. No, hung- <laughs> it feels like it. <laughs> yes. The hungry gap is actually that well-known time round about early spring, when you've used up mm. most of your winter produce, but the spring-summer produce isn't yet ready. Exactly. It's, it depends on your location, but it's kind of end of April, early May time-ish. And everything's bolting because it's their flowering time. Yes. So it does help, you know, to be growing successionally, working out your plantings. You can get beetroots in a bit earlier in the polytunnel for some early harvest. Or if you've not got a polytunnel outside under a cloche, bring things on a little earlier. It still is the time when there isn't loads and loads of variety, but you can certainly have some young beetroots some turnips that kind of thing, radishes, lots of different greens. And the blessing of things going to flower is almost entirely the shoots are edible. Ah. So it's also about looking at your plant and thinking, not just this cabbage, I can now no longer eat it because I didn't eat it and it's gone to flower. You think, oh, great, cut it and you still can use all of that cabbage. I think what you say chimes with me because we're so led by what we see in the supermarket as to what we think we can eat. Exactly. And of course, once you start growing your own, you realise you're much more creative with stems, leaves, flowers, all stages of the plant and the vegetable life. Yes, because, you know, you've grown it, so you really want to make the most of it. And the other great thing about that flowering time is it's incredibly good for wildlife. The flowers are 
very good food, not just for bees, which we all talk about, but also hoverflies, ladybirds, and my favourite, which are wasps, mm. because they are such good predators. Mm. And my happy time is when I see the queen wasp making her nest, as long as it's not in my house. She had to think about that once. And um, also all the parasitic, the small parasitic wasps, these flowering brassicas encourage them into the garden and then you've got a really good biodiversity which means that when the bugs come there's things waiting to eat them or waiting to eat the aphid and such so that helps and i try and have flowering brassicas actually as much of the year as i can for that reason it feeds various different kinds of insects that are hugely beneficial which as an organic grower is really important that you've got a good you need the, the bugs as well otherwise the predators have nothing to eat but it's working out that balance and the secret is not panicking when the bugs arrive exactly because you've already provided for their predators it's waiting yeah that brings me very neatly on to organic why is organic important to you um it's a very natural way of growing and also i think it's a much healthier way of growing that you're not ingesting all those chemicals It's also much better for the soil and soil life, which is crucial for all of us. It's much better for wildlife. For me, it's a no-brainer. And as my elderly neighbours said, back in the day, it was all organic. Mm. You know, it's only relatively short period of time in human history that all this vast use of chemicals has come into play. I want to talk to you particularly about the books that you've written. The first one with Charles about grow, cook, use and store all your organic produce. And it seems to me it's interesting to talk to somebody who not only knows how to grow organically, but knows what to do with it when they've harvested it. Absolutely, yes. Um, When our publishers approached us with the idea, um, they very much wanted that aspect of not only producing as much food as possible in whatever space you have, But also then, what happens next? I like to see how many things I can make out of each plant that I grow. That's what struck me about the book, because it's not just a book about vegetable soup recipes. There's so much more in it. It's how to store the vegetables, how to preserve them. You even have tips on how to turn them into household cleaners and such. Exactly. So something like parsley, for example, it obviously has all the culinary uses, You can dry it very easily to store it. You can chop it up and freeze it as well, if you prefer. It makes a fantastic cleaner for the bathroom and kitchen. Just parsley on it? Parsley and vinegar. Mm -hmm. You infuse the vinegar with the parsley. If you Google online parsley cleaners, you can see a wide range of cleaners which include parsley. And in the book, we show you how to make cleaners for free, almost, if you've got the vinegar. And um, you can use the seeds... The flowers attract different pollinators, so it's looking at a plant in many different perspectives. Yes, it's got the holistic view towards it. Exactly, it's not just something you put on the edge of your plate as a garnish. Now, talking of time, I'm intrigued because here is someone who clearly spends her days out getting her hands muddy, her boots muddy, growing everything she can, then harvesting it, then cooking it and yet still finding time to write about it and bringing up a family. It's fascinating, Steph. What is the secret behind this? (laughs) Rum on the mantelpiece, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think it's working out a balance as much as you can. I mean, I probably don't have what anyone would consider balance. I do tend to do pretty much a seven-day week, but I'm very flexible. I'm very lucky that my work is very flexible, So it's not like I'm doing a nine to five job now and then, but every single day. And you can only go to the allotment in the evening. Exactly. So I can schedule my writing. I look at each week is different. So I look at Charles and I do courses together. So I look at, are we doing those? Um, Tomorrow I'm giving a course in Salisbury. So these things are what I put as like the framework for the week. And then I work out, I look at the weather and see, okay, Tuesday's going to be horrible weather, so that's a really good day for writing um, an article for one of the magazines I write for, that's when I'll do that. Wednesday looks great, so Wednesday's the day I'm going to hoe the allotment. And you have to have a bit of flexibility, because obviously things can go wrong. I like, I'm an early riser, so I like to do things in the morning, and then 
go to bed early, so I would prefer to write earlier in the day than later in the day. And did you find the writing easy? Did it come naturally? I do get mental blocks, but I was a very bookish child, and my degrees in um, literature and art history, so all my life I've written. So it's not that great a step from writing about Shakespeare to writing about cabbages, really. (laughs) Of cabbages and things. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But the joy of this book, the one I'm referring to, the um, Grow, Cook, Use and Store Your Harvest, Mm. and your other one, the Creative Kitchen, you talk not just about cooking with the plants, but also all the other things you can do with them. One is obviously how to store them. So there's a lot of pickling and fermenting and, and other forms of storage. And then also how to do things like making household cleaners with them. There's even some um, cosmetics with, made with herbs and oils and things. It's fascinating. Thank you. And you must have enjoyed writing it because it's certainly very inspiring to read. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It's great. It's great from writing it. And also it fits in very much, I think, with people's desires to reduce plastic. Yes. Because you're, you're using fewer products. That My interest in making these things comes from being um, quite allergic to artificial fragrances um, in the respect that I'll come out with um, a horrible rash or I'll sneeze or I'll get a blinding headache. So most laundry powders I react to, most put one of those air fresheners in a room and I'll get a headache. So I was learning from in my 20s onwards various things I could use that didn't make me feel poorly. Um, I'm very fortunate that it's mild allergies. I mean, some people get much worse, obviously. And it's just such a lark. And also you can really make lovely scented things and it almost makes cleaning nice. Well, I must say, I was very impressed by your fizzing toilet. Oh, yeah, they're a joy. Cleansers. I mean, yes. I've heard of bath bombs. I've not heard of toilet bombs before. It's like a bath bomb, but you make them in an um, ice cube tray. So you've got that size, little, little, rectangle, square. little yes. squares. And you'll put different... So it's almost the same ingredients as a bath bomb. But the herbs are different, so you'll put things in which are very good for cleaning toilets, such as rosemary or thyme or lemon um, balm, and then you pop those in, and they will fizz on their own, but if you want true fizzing joy, long (laughs) evenings fly by here, um, (laughs) pop some vinegar in and the whole thing goes fizz, 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 and it's just, it's lovely. It's, It's fantastic. It's good fun, and you can keep them in a jar in the bathroom and... It looks very country living, you know, it's all charming. Well, you heard it here, listener, how to have fizzing joy in your yeah. diet. <laughs> but also what to do with all those lemon skins and, exactly. and the citrus skins. And I just, it, it's so practical. That's what yeah. I like about because it. It's good, it's nice not to have the waste, because if you're making something that's using a lot of lemon juice, these are the things you can do with all yes. the, the rinds. Yes. So you can make a very simple cleaner just by putting them in a jar filling it up with vinegar, leaving it for two weeks, straining it, smells amazing, will clean everything. And I remember my grandmother baked her orange peel in the mm. bottom oven of her agar, and that was lovely, the smell from mm. that, and she would use them on the fire. Yeah, I, you can do that. I dry them in the airing cupboard, a similar thing, it just takes longer. And if you've got just the peel, not the pith, and dry that, and then whiz it up in a food processor, that is a really good base for skin scrubs, because citrus is really good for your skin. Mm. You can use it in your toilet bombs. Oh, back to the toilet bombs. And you can also add it to cooking, because it's assuming you're using organic citrus, because otherwise you've got the horrible waxes and things on the surface. And also I then thought, well, Im- let's imagine a situation where you haven't got any citrus, but you want it for a recipe. And in the creative kitchen, I've got various recipes using garden herbs for things you can make, which you could then use instead of using lemon juice in a recipe. So I was imagining a situation where you suddenly have the urge for something and there's no lemons to be seen. Yes. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. One thing I do want to ask you, Steph, is I'm fascinated. I'm a cook as well, Mm -hmm. and I do a lot of creative cooking rather than slavishly following a recipe. And I'm really intrigued by recipe writing. Do you have to keep adjusting every time you say you're going to do a soup or a hummus mm. recipe or whatever? You have to get the measurements exactly right. Is Do you have to cook it a second time because you used half a teaspoon instead of three quarters of a teaspoon? Is it very, very precise writing a recipe? Yes, because for a book, absolutely. 
because I think you've always got to be aware that not everybody is confident with playing with a recipe. So I might open a recipe, but I love reading recipe books, reading other people's ideas and things. And I might look at something and say, ah, I don't have that ingredient, but this will work fine. Mm. But if you're quite new to cooking, um, then that might not, you might not feel confident about that. And I think so a lot of people feel much more comfortable having these parameters and you have to check it several times. Right. In my blog, where I also sometimes put recipes up, there I'll be a bit more flexible. Yeah. And I'll say, you can do this, you can do that. But I do try with the recipes to say, these are the alternatives you can use. And so people know that actually I don't have to have chard. I could use kale or I could use spinach. Yes. And then it's like suddenly it becomes a year round recipe rather than just something you can do in a specific period. So another thing that interested me, Steph, was looking at some of your recipes. In fact, I think probably all of them. You've grown most of the ingredients. Is that right? Yeah, they're almost entirely recipes for things that you can grow yourself without any fancy equipment. You could use simple cloches rather than a polytunnel but grow yourself in the UK. Yeah. And there'll be a few things you can't very easily, olive oil or black pepper, but almost entirely. And um, I think that you can have the pleasure then of an absolute home-cooked meal. Yeah. But I also made sure that all the quantities for things like pulses or cooked tomatoes are the same as opening a tin, because also there's real life so people coming home from work, you might have a few things from your garden or allotment, but you haven't had time to soak beans or you don't have any home preserved tomatoes. I made sure the quantities were that you can actually just open the tins and add those as well, because then it's much less stress free and it's more um, attainable this is what in I mean real about life that situations. Excellent combination of creative, but also very practical. Yeah, because sometimes you come home from work and you feel the last thing you want to do is make soak some beans or something. Yes, <laughs> Opening a tin of pulses is just fine. Yeah. And you can get great organic ones. Or For anyone who's listening who's starting out on the organic journey, what would your advice be? They may not have an allotment even. They may just have a small area in their backyard and or even just grow on a balcony. From starting small, what would be your advice? I think if you only had a very small space, I think some of the best things to grow in a really small space are herbs, particularly the herbs that um, fit with the kind of food that you like. I mean, something like growing coriander, which is one of my favourites, if you grow it yourself, you've not only got the leaves, which you can use in your food, and the stems are also edible, but when they go to flower, then if it's a balcony or an outside space, you're attracting the beneficial pollinators. You can also eat those flowers. Then they'll go to a green seed. And you cannot buy that in the shops. It tastes like lemony coriander. It's got a zing. And sprinkle that on your salads, on hummus, on anything that you're cooking that would benefit from a coriander, lemony, zingy addition. It's fantastic. It's the pleasure of something you can only eat if you've grown it yourself. And then if you've got some that dry, you can use those either to grow more coriander or whisk them up in a food process and have your own homemade coriander spice. And then remove the coriander from the pot and you've got the roots, which are highly prized in Thai cooking. They use them all the time, but it's something you can use to add another flavour dimension. It's one of the sheer pleasures of growing your own, I think, is fresh flavours and also being able to experience things that are a bit different and just explore all the possibilities, really, that vegetables offer. Brilliant. I really love that. I used to run a kitchen garden for Cameron Mackintosh. Yeah. I had to grow coriander yes. year-round all the time. Yes. And so during the really big flowering time... 
I was just having to sew it almost like micro leaves. So I would sew it thickly in a seed tray. Yes. And it would get a cut. I mean, he had had a massive greenhouse to play with. He's a billionaire. You know, it's like, you will get your coriander. (laughs) But the good thing from that was from having to provide coriander for him... I learn all these ways of doing it, yes. which are then, oh, this is how, if you want to know how to have coriander in yes. April, grow it as a micro leaf and then wait until its flowering time's passed and then start yeah. to grow it as a herb again yeah. because then it won't bolt. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite yeah. handy. Just those practical yeah. things, yeah. One other thing that struck me from your book, Steph, was the very strong message about eating seasonally. In other words, not supermarket shopping where you can see in January you can see strawberries and raspberries and uh, tomatoes flown in from Spain or whatever I think this is something that you feel very strongly about and it's part of the organic message isn't it absolutely yes I think it's it's a very important thing um, that we've lost as you say with supermarkets and so much choice all the time and I think eating seasonally has been viewed as something that is um Oh, what's the word? I can't remember the word. Um, oh, slightly puritanical. Yeah, it's, you know, not yes. a, it's kind of drab. Mm. That you just, like, spend the whole winter eating turnip and nothing else until the spring when you might have a spinach leaf. It's been given a very poor perce- perception. The thing with eating seasonally, actually, is it's a great joy and a great pleasure. It's not something that is spoiling your palate in any way because... You then start enjoying and looking forward to flavours. So you can tweak the season a bit. You can cover plants with fleece to bring them on a couple of weeks earlier. You can grow potatoes in pots indoors to get a Christmas crop of new potatoes. That's still eating seasonally because you've grown it. It's just tweaking. But I've got in my back garden, I've got temperly early rhubarb. I've got an old dustbin on top of it. And so I've forced some. And yesterday I made rhubarb muffins for our course. Because we hadn't tasted rhubarb for months. And that utter pleasure. You've got the anticipation of the first raspberry. I think it's particularly exciting with fruit because of the sweetness and the colours and you just feel, oh, summer's here. And also your palate is fresh, isn't it? It's not jaded by having these things constantly every day. Yeah, and also if you're eating out of season, it's been shipped in from goodness knows where. So it's got the air miles, various processing will have happened to it. You're not eating as fresh as you could. Do you know, I went to a talk given by a woman who is in charge of the chemical pest and disease control. This is a large company that grows vegetables in Kenya and mostly beans. So all those French beans that you see in plastic packets in supermarkets. Ignore the fact that they're growing it on the side of Lake Naivashu. Ignore the fact that they're draining water that really they can't afford to drain anymore. Ignore the fact they're using local labour, but local labour is not benefiting from the Mm. food at all. Ignore the fact it's using their land. The worst part of it is 50% of it is thrown away before it's even air-freighted. Yeah, I think it's it's a horrible thing. And we do waste, as as a species, we waste a lot of food, particularly in the West. So if people were not wasting food, if everything was used in the way that food should be respected, not just thrown into landfill or whatever happens to it, then the argument, I think, that you can't produce enough food without all these horrible chemical cocktails kind of falls apart. Mm. And um, there are so many wonderful things that you can eat and have such a rich and varied diet that... And with preserving, you can still have the taste of tomatoes in the winter, Mm. but it's either bottled tomatoes or tomato chutney. If you dehydrate tomatoes and then put them in a food processor, (laughs) one of my things, make it into a powder, then you've got this amazing tomato powder, which you can add to sauces, spoonfuls of that in the winter time, into soups, into stews. It adds a lovely tomatoey dimension it's a much better flavor than tomatoes bought from the supermarket in december 
so it's and then you've got that pleasure of that first tomato oh, that yeah. you pick that you've grown exactly it, it is such a joy yeah. it is really good so and there's good benefits as well um if things are in season it's going to be better for your gut health because they're going to be um, just healthier food that you're eating the vegetables are going to be fresher and if your gut's happier then your body's happier i hope you enjoyed our unpruned chat be sure to subscribe to the organic gardening podcast and you'll never miss an episode